Another edition of uh, the Four Bs, the American Constitution, uh, in uh, or the Chaos Constitution in American Life. Uh, here, this is uh, our second uh, academic season in which to discuss and hopefully help you think about uh, the American Constitution, politics, and uh, history. Uh, we are here uh, in the beautiful Central Valley of California. I am here in the beautiful Central Valley of California. The other three people actually live in Paradise. Uh, but we're actually moving into fall as we had a very cool 85 today. All right. We had, uh, I saw people with sweatshirts on and, uh, you know, earmuffs, uh, cause that's about a 20 degree drop in a, in a week. So, uh, and, uh, so today, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be talking about American federalism, a topic dear to the hearts of the four B's, uh, one in which there is actually no consensus whatsoever. And so hopefully, uh, will generate some heat uh, in this discussion. I'd like to, <coughs> excuse me, I'd like to start off, <coughs> I apologize. Um, uh, and the question kind of focuses on a uh, quote by John Adams and it asks us to uh, look at this question of divided sovereignty and federalism. Uh, and John Adams uh, said, uh, our new government is a new attempt to divide a sovereignty, a fresh essay at imperium in imperio. It cannot therefore be expected to be very stable or very uh, firm. So, and again, I, I like this quote because it tends to affirm my worldview on things. Uh, but I think we would all agree that uh, federalism is at the center of, to me, almost every major question in our constitutional political history. I think it's been adjudicated far more than any other issue at the Supreme Court level. Uh, and just to give us a little bit of insight on partly what maybe Adams was saying is I'll, I'll go to uh, one of, uh, I know it's got to be Tim's favorite historical characters, Charles de Gaulle uh, from uh, France. And uh, he was uh, uh, once noted as saying, how do you govern a country which has 246 variety of cheeses? That same, that same thing could be said about the United States and its attempt to divide sovereignty. We have a total, according to the Census Bureau, of 90,000 governmental units in the United States. According to most scholars, federalism is the key to understanding the nature of US politics because it shaped the terrain of political conflict, generated powerful, pa uh, powerful past dependencies uh, that limit the scope of government action and structured the sequence of events and the development of US public policy. Some would argue, and I think Mr. Kavanaugh especially, but even Professor Moore uh, would agree that the federal system is a key element in maintaining, main, in maintaining liberty for long in our constitutional history, while others, myself, have argued that it has been one of the most effective means of protecting the established interests and, and one of leading uh, the engines of inequality in America. So, what I'd like to do is start off with one of my very broad questions that helps me get a sense. Is, although I know the three of you fairly well, uh, there's still so much to come to understand about your worldview. So I'd like to start off with a real broad question here. And I'd like to start off with Professor Williams, because I know he loves to be the first to be called in these sessions. Professor Williams, in your opinion, all right, has America survive so long, and I'm going to put in quotes, as a constitutional democracy, and we like to promote that if we go back to our session on American exceptionalism, we like to claim that we're the longest living democratic form of government in uh, world uh, history, or at least constitutional democratic government. Do you think that is due to the constitutional structure and design set out in 1787? Or has it more to do with our geography and our wealth of resources, all right, that have led to our survival? So how do you see America's survival as a free country for so long? Wow, I don't, I don't see it as being um, linked to our federal system, that part of our constitutional structure. I think our, our, that part of our constitutional structure has actually caused the most strife and violence throughout our history. Um, now, to, to the other side of that argument is, okay, so what has um, helped us survive? 
I would say, um, yeah, it's a combination of when you talk about resources, um, we have been able to um, sort of withstand some conflict by having some space for people to move <laughs> around, right? So I think that that matters. And I think even the resources that we have um, have on our continent at our disposal have helped us to remain free more so than the constitutional structure. Professor Cavanaugh, you agree with uh, Ms. Broyles? Well, I thought I was listening to Frederick Jackson Turner there for a second, um, talking about the, you know, the frontier uh, that we've always had that has enabled, uh, I think he uses the term crystallize when things in the East begin to crystallize, right? And uh, there's always that safety valve. So what happens when the, the safety valve is gone? Right. Um, so uh, I, I think to a degree, I do think that our geography has helped us immensely to avoid things uh, that maybe other European nations have been drawn into. Um, I don't know that our democratic constitutional system, you know, I'm thinking, has that allowed us to maintain a level of success? Uh, yeah, but it's also been a detriment as well. I mean, so I think it's it's helped and it's also hindered us. But um, I would say the geography point of your question is, is yes, I think that has definitely helped. Professor Moore? Well, first of all, uh, I'd like to address Charles de Gaulle. Uh, I mean, I can walk, <laughs> I can walk uh, four or five blocks down the street here and go to a cheese shop and they've got 300 kinds of cheeses right in my little town. So uh, take that, Chucky. Um, <laughs> But uh, I, knew, I knew that was coming. <laughs> of course, you, of course you did. Um, but uh, it's a great question, Dave, uh, as to whether the geography factors into this. I, I think um, I, I think America, in many ways, was was kind of um, destined to to have a federal system because they they wrestled with the uh, the zero sum nature of uh, uh, the unitary system that England had. Uh, but they also wrestled with the debacle of decentralized power for for eight, uh, eight nine years under the Articles of Confederation. So I think given those two ingredients um, in the cake, uh, they tried to, to um, strike a balance of having a national system as well as a, a, a local system in the Madisonian system. So it, it, uh, I think it was inevitable. And I actually would agree that it's it's been the source of great uh, pain and gr uh, great sorrow, but also uh, there's a modicum of independence out in the territories or the states um, to to experiment. So uh, so I think it cuts both ways actually um, in our history. Yeah, I, I would just I would just add that in terms of today, when you look out at governments around the world, I mean most governments are not federal systems. I mean, this is another way the United States is exceptional in that we're kind of unique. And, and the places that have the federal system are places that have big diverse populations. That's, that's the places that tend to utilize them. Um, and the, the reason why is because it allows for these different regional subsets of the population to keep their cultural values intact. Now, that's a whole separate situation about what that, or conversation about what that means for, um, having a unified nation and a national identity. But I think that we, I think in this way, the founders, you know, even in 1787, we were, we might've been considered a big diverse nation for that time, but this was really some forethought. I, I, I don't know whether trying a unitary system in 1789 would have at all worked given what we know is happening in terms of the, the move West. So, um, they were kind of ahead of their times in knowing that a federal system was going to be needed for a big diverse place. Well, you are right that, you know, a, a kind of about an international and a comparative sense of federalism, but you would know better than I that there's kind of the spectrum of federalism, especially when we look at sovereignty uh, there. And, and again, I am, that's, you know, I should know more than I do uh, about that topic, but I, I think of Canada, uh, you know, as the closest neighbor and having such a similar history uh, to ours, uh, and I'm just wondering if anybody knows, is it pretty much a mirror image of our federal system or does the national government Canada have a little bit more authority vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis the provinces or states uh, up there? Does anybody happen to know? I think it's fairly similar to ours, David, honestly. 
Okay. I mean, yeah. I, you know, I don't provincial want to governments, the provincial governments do have a, a, um, you know, I guess you could compare them to American states in terms of their ability to determine uh, certain things, but it may be where the scale, you know, north of the border tilts a little bit more towards the central government than it does the provincial government. Yeah. And that's, you know, and that's what I, you know, that spectrum there. And it, it is maybe, especially between uh, nation states of the world, it is a matter of degrees. So what really flummoxed me as I was preparing for this is one, you've got the Adams quote, which tends to give us a, a, a sense that he's got a kind of a, a, a sour, you know, taste in his mouth as he looks at this concept of divided sovereignty. And then I think we're all aware that Alexander Hamilton, uh, who some consider the most hostile uh, to the state governments, uh, said that two sovereignties cannot coexist within the same limits. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, he was known in some ways as a provocateur at Philadelphia. And my understanding is that delegate to the Constitutional Convention uh, that he called for the abolition of the states as, uh, as sovereigns and the reduction to mere administrative uh, units and electoral units uh, of a strong national uh, government. And we all know that Madison's own Virginia plan made the state subject to a national veto over state laws uh, in most cases. So given that you got Adams, Hamilton, and Madison, three of the big names and I guess major influencers of the uh, 18th uh, century, how did we end up with this divided sovereignty, which they all warned was a major problem? How do we end up with it, though? Mr. Moore? Well, I, I'll circle back. I think, um, you know, I'll, I'll start with Madison. He, he, he wrote some letters before the convention and actually sounded as Hamiltonian as possible. He, he was uh, uh, interested in reducing uh, the states, but, but in the same letters where he's proposing this, um, he's also saying that there's an inevitable, I mean, <laughs> what can we get past at Philadelphia? So uh, historical inertia is a big deal even though a Madison pre-convention would have been uh, quite satisfied, satisfied with uh, uh, getting rid of the states. I mean, there's enough, I mean, he was in Congress and knew well enough all the hassles that the articles Congress faced by being held hostage to the states. But that, that 150 years of benign neglect works, <laughs> it, it, there's two things that happen because of that benign neglect. One is, uh, kind of a national story. There's this national thing called America that evolves and develops, but there's also state things that evolved and get very jealous of their sovereignty. So benign ne neglect is a powerful, powerful set of inertia that I would suggest plays heavily into the, the trade-off of uh, unitary versus confederal systems in the Madisonian system. It's, a, I, it's just baked in the cake. So Mr. Cavanaugh, to kind of you know, feed off of that. It seems to me Mr. Moore is saying that in the end, our constitution is much more about practical politics uh, rather than constitutional principles. Is, is that accurate for me to say, or is that, do you share that view or? or? Um, I think there's a level of both, honestly, because there are constitutional principles, but there is a practical matter of how can you get it ratified? You still got to get it ratified. So, I mean, uh, one of the things I always told my students, politics is compromise. And we all know that the Constitution is a very compromised a, a document with many compromises. I would like to go back, though, for a second in terms of federalism and maybe uh, I would maybe even argue with Adams in the fact that, you know, we came from a federal system, if you think about it. We had a strong central government. It just happened to be across the Atlantic Ocean. We had weaker regional governments, or we'll call them colonial governments, that were given charters, various charters that enabled them to do certain things. Now you, you have that system set up. And now exactly what Tim just mentioned, the 150-year time period of benign or salutary neglect, and now these colonial governments are going to develop on their own with this independence. And so now it's like, okay, we're going to go back to a more central power under the Constitution. And you can find anti-federalists, and Tim will know more than me, but, you know, that quote about serving two masters, there are going to be a lot of anti-federalists will have that very same feeling 
of when the constitution is created, but I want the students listening to understand the idea of uh, federalism is not new because we actually, in the colonial period, we came from a federal system. We had a strong central government under the crown and parliament. We had weaker colonial governments. So it's just like uh, this, you know, the, the sliding scale of sovereignty. Who's going to have the power and, and who's going to, you know, where is it going to stop? I'm sorry, Mr. Just, I got to push one, back. One, I, one quick, uh, to extend Chris's thought just a little bit. Every time uh, Parliament or the Crown uh, attempted to consolidate power in the colonial era, this tremendous blowback in the colonies. Um, what that, uh, how I read that is that they, to Chris's point, there's a federal system in place, and they're very jealous of their local autonomy um, when when uh, Parliament attempts to consolidate. Okay, can we agree to call it cultural fe federalism? not legal federalism there because we all know that sure yeah there's there's this cultural notion of you know brought about by benign neglect that these uh colonies have some kind of sovereignty but in the last analysis at least upon the legal foundation of the empire the colonies have nothing to stand upon i mean if there no, were no 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 i'm gonna, I'm gonna an push the court of review you know, pa Parliament and the Crown have absolute sovereignty to do what they want to do. Um, well, now you now you just went to a constitutional argument, David. Uh, That's now, legal. Well, all I'm suggesting is that uh, you know the the uh, the Dominion of New England is the great example of blowback when Parliament wants to consolidate. That's a constitutional crisis. The response to the Stamp Act is a constitutional response. Uh, we are in um, uh, Dickinson, I think, uh, letters from a Pennsylvania farmer writes, uh, you can't treat us like dominions. Um, you know, you, you can't you can't obliterate us through these through these laws you're passing. Uh, there's also other instances where there's legal challenges to the assertion of parliamentary sovereignty um, within the colony. So there there is a constant. So I'm going to push back just a little bit on just seeing this as a cultural category i think there's a an argument to be made that there's a legal constitutional uh, but, you're not, federalism. You're not, but you're not arguing that that the the british crown gave the colonies enumerated sort of functions and rights i mean they, they could i mean if they could back it up with their might under the realm uh, rhode island couldn't do anything i mean they had to come enforce it but lee I'm, I'm kind of with dave on this Legally and constitutionally, I can't believe I just said that. Uh, okay. <laughs> I don't. I don't see. I don't see how built into the structure of 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 that time period with that those structures that there is anything like enumerated powers that we would think of as a federal system. Well, see, this is this is I, I I'm I'm obviously with with Tim on this because so my my screen's perfectly divided here, but Adjutants and Bulldogs. <laughs> <laughs> You have, you know, these colonial documents that are, are, you know, charters and then other documents that come into a certain uh, to uh, assert rights that they have based upon their colonial rights. And you see pushback after pushback after pushback, not always successful, you know, when the crown tries to implement something, especially, you know, post 1763, after the, the Seven Years War, the French and Indian War. So when the crown starts to assert itself after the period of uh, salutary neglect, you do see this pushback because they're going to argue that, wait a minute, we have these legal rights here and you're infringing upon these legal rights. I think the Stamp Act is a great response. I mean, the Stamp Act Congress is a, a great response to that. So I think it's, way, it's more than cultural. And there, well, the, the, wait, the wait, 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 wait. In the Declaratory Act, you know, the, the you know, England, and again, Mike's absolutely right. This is about might makes right, you know, kind of argument. Sure. Here, you know, uh, but in the Declaratory Act, the British make it fundamentally clear. They can declare, they can pass whatever laws they want vis-a-vis -vis the colonies, and they are consistent with the British Constitution. Well, but the, 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 I guess my argument is there's a development of federalism in the colonies because of distance, but also I think uh, there's 
there, there's a federalism that develops simply because um, there, there's, a, there's a squishiness to the British Constitution. So when, I mean, Mike's right, there's no enumerated nature to the colonial constitutions, but there's not a written nature to the, to the Constitution of Britain in general. Uh, so that leaves some space for, I think, this, um, this British federalism to develop. But to me, I mean, to me, I think the distinction is between as British subjects, individuals could claim that they had certain rights that were being violated by the parliament. That, that I buy, but the, they're claiming those rights as individual British subjects or British citizens. They're not claiming that right through the, the Rhode Island constitution that is then, you know, somehow been bequeathed some enumerated powers from the crown. So I, when I think of federalism, I, I, I think more of, of regional entities like sharing sovereignty. And I don't know, I just, maybe I didn't so Mike, you, I don't see that in the colonial system as- So you don't see that as a shared sovereignty between the crown and parliament and the colonial charters that were set up, that's not a shared sovereignty? No, I think under British law, well, parliament yeah. is sovereign. I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, technically you're right because this, the crown could prorogue uh, legislatures and did with blowback, uh, would uh, revoke charters. So yeah, there is, there, there's the unitary piece of that. But um, where the rubber meets the road quite often on a day-to-day -day basis, I, all I'm suggesting is there's an element of a uh, high degree of independence. Now, whether that floats over into sovereignty, uh, okay, I think you've done a great job of creating the, the political science categories and made the great argument that ultimately there is a sovereign here and that, and that could prorogue in um, revoke charters. I would equate it to uh, the, you know, the, the current and in the historical situation of states vis-a-vis -vis counties, cities, townships, and whatever. I know Wisconsin, and I, I gotta believe North Dakota as well. You know, we're a, the, our state is a unitary system. All right. The state gives certain authority to counties and cities, but they can take it back. And that's where I see the British, you know, Parliament and Crown. They, you know, they can, okay, yeah, we'll let you guys take care of this. We'll give you this essence of sovereignty, but they can take it back. And 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 whether that leads to cultural federalism and a mindset, it definitely has in the states in the 20th century. You know, the, the times that I hear, you know, or the state of Cal the state government intruding upon our sovereign yeah. rights as the city of Bakersfield, you know, part of me wants to say, I don't know if that's necessarily true. And I'm sure that goes on uh, sure. in, in the other two states. Just, that we're just one more, about. one more, one more piece of evidence to consider the um, Albany plan, 1754. Um, you would think the parliament would have, it never even got to parliament for them to reject the proposal. It was essentially Franklin um, proposing kind of a continental government, uh, largely to do Native American policy. It was rejected by the, the colonial legislatures. They did not want to give up any of their power. Now, was it sovereignty? I mean, we could quibble about that. But there's an element of individualness and separateness and, and authority that the colonials were always sensitive about. So I think the Albany plan might play into that, uh, into my argument. So how do you explain the sentiments expressed in John Adams' quote, if indeed there's this kind of naturally evolved sense of federal federalism within the, the colonies and then, you know, the states, where does, what's the source of Adams' discontent with with this notion of uh, of divided sovereignty. Well, I'm going to I'm going to say what I think, and then I'll let Tim give the right answer. Um, <laughs> I think if you look at the date of the letter, 1790, you know we had just been through the debates of the ratification period. I mean, they're still fresh in the mind, and you know there's a lot of division, you know, within uh, everywhere within the states. So like, okay, are we going to have this document or not? Because it certainly seems to be usurping power away from our state governments. Now we're creating a stronger central government. So I think in my mind, it's like, he's saying this is weak now. It's not very stable because it's new to us. And we're moving from where we had a, a state sovereignty under the articles to a government where, you know, you have a national sovereignty now under this new government uh, under the constitution. 
So there's still an issue of uh, debate, distrust, uncertainty. That's, I think, the, the idea of his, uh, the, the, but not being very stable and firm. But now let Tim give the right answer. Oh, I, I think Chris, uh, Chris is right. Um, and, and I would simply add that, remember, in 1790, we're not, uh, Rhode Island hasn't joined yet. There are uh, circular letters floating around, um, although several of them had been beaten back, proposing a new, uh, a new con um, convention. Convention, yeah. Um, so there's, uh, and everybody had, uh, after Massachusetts, had been sending along these recommendatory amendments. So I think, uh, I think the reality is there is a lot of, ner um, uh, not disunity, but there's a, there's a question about whether this is going to be viable. And also, I would suggest you can never discount Adam's nervousness. He's all—he's always nervous. He's always nervous. Uh, so I think there's an element of Adam's personality in that quote. But also, I don't want to get too um, uh, doing psychohistory here. But uh, I think it plays into anything you read <laughs> that Madison said or that Adam said. But the reality is, that, to Chris's point, is exactly it's not a full done deal country. We're unified. It's going to work. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uncertainty in here. I just uh, watched the uh, HBO Adam series again, and I, I just part of me just watches and goes, I wonder how accurate of a depiction that is uh, of John Adams' general personality. Uh, oh, personality, there. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh no, the, yeah. That, you know, it was like the sixth time I watched it, and I this time I got pretty critical on it. So, <laughs> Professor Williams, I want to ask you this. There's a common, you know, I guess message taught, especially at high school and probably, you know, uh, entry level government classes at the uh, university that uh, our federal system makes states laboratories of democracy. And therefore, it's a positive uh, thing. It's especially defenders of our federal system, especially make that argument. Do you agree with that, or do you see our federal system and the role of states as laboratories of despotism and engines of inequality? <laughs> well, and what I would, well, and again, I'll, I'll give you kind of a reference here. I mean, I would make the argument that the number one reason for our federal system is slave states. Mm -hmm. Is yeah, uh, as Tim said, in the world of practical politics. They could not get ratification without the slave states. Uh, and so they had to give up a lot of sovereignty to those states in order to protect the institution of slavery. Womb four score and so many years later, we have a civil war. And even after the civil war with the 13th, 14th and 15th uh, amendment, uh, the fact of the matter is uh, that states are still given a lot of sovereignty to implement economic policy, political policy and uh, in our next, uh, uh, session that we do, we're going to be talking about uh, elections and voting rights there. So I would argue that what federalism does is it leads to the lowest common denominator for states. They're allowed to do a lot in the world of despotism. Which side are you on? Uh, you know, are they laboratories of democracy and it's a great uh, experiment or, yeah, they're more of a laboratory of despotism? Well, I, I think, I mean, I, I'm going to use my political science categories and say it's probably both because, I mean, I mean, democracy the way you just framed it if democracy means that the majority or uh, a very loud minority can keep um a great subset of the group from participating i mean democracy by itself is not a great system right we're, we're looking for something like liberal democracy where people's rights and basic freedoms are protected now we've we've talked about this in other programs that that probably doesn't happen in the united states in any real sense until the 1960s right but yeah was were states laboratories for just majority rules democracy yeah i would say yeah on par and 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 you know i'm not an expert in in state and local government but my reading of the history is that on par there's probably been more examples of states at the local level taking away people's freedoms and um and rights than than providing them over time so I think it's both. I think you see it's a laboratory for democracy and you get to see what democracy looks like when those liberal checks are not there either institutionally or culturally. 
Uh, but if you like if you like uh, smoking weed, uh, you like the laboratories experiments uh, that's going on in the states. You, um, I mean, some of the Western states experimented in expanding the right to vote to women uh, pretty early. So, I mean, yeah, I, Mike's Mike's right. I think it cuts both ways. Um, the experimentation sometimes works out, and sometimes. <laughs> They do I mean, remember the in the Confederation there was laboratory of democracy going on in the states, and most of the nationalists at the convention were fed up with the exper the laboratories of democracy because of the uh, the financial chicaneries that were going on in those experimentations. So it, I, I you know, it cuts both ways. And I think Mike right, Mike's right. Mr. Kavanaugh, any thoughts um, on that? Uh, the answer would be yes. <laughs> no, I mean, I know it's, I know it's kind of flippant, but it's exactly what these guys said. I agree because so much of it depends on where you fall on each issue, right? I mean, because now we're talking about what was the experiment? What are we trying to find out? Are we trying to limit people's access to the polls? Are we trying to make people right. guess how many bubbles in a bar of soap? Then I would say that is a despot, that's a despotic rule. But are we saying, you know what, uh, we're going to, you know, have same-sex marriage. That's an expansion. So I, 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 my answer would be yes, it's both ways, but so much of it depends on where you fall in each specific issue and which, you know, which way your twig is bent, so to speak, uh, determining whether or not that's good. I mean, I think of like, uh, for you guys, the, the big thing was, um, uh, you know, sanctuary cities, right? Now that these certain cities were going to be given that title, though we know that, I mean, if, you, if students dig into this, it's really kind of a misnomer, but certain cities are going to, or certain localities are not going to maybe cooperate with ICE and identify people and have them deported quickly. Uh, is, you know, is that a violation of federal law? Maybe, but so much of it just depends on which, which way your twig is bent, I think. Well, see, what I'm hearing is some kind of equivalency from uh you and professor moore oh yeah you know i'm sorry the overwhelming history of this country of uh, states and localities is despotism yeah you know professor moore brings up marijuana and some things nice but what about uh you know redlining let's look at voting rights let's look at religious liberty uh let's look at free speech we can go on and on and on and show which is why you know the overwhelming number of Supreme Court cases when it comes to the denial of liberty are not the federal government, they're the state governments and they're local governments. So I, I do find it interesting that it seems to me, and I could be wrong because I'm wrong nine out of 10 times, that your answers are kind of, well, yeah, it breaks both well, ways. I think, no, I think... it, yeah, it breaks both ways, you know, but that's like saying, you know, uh, a 100 hitter is the same as a 300 hitter. I think it's know, easier to see. David, I think it's easier to see, uh, to use a term from the founding era, it's easier to see tyranny of the majority at the state level. I think it's easier to see that. In our history, I'm not going to disagree with you. Our history is ripe with that, um, where you see people at the local level say, well, we're going to do this for us, but not for those folks. We're going to make sure some people have this, but not others. And that really has been a struggle. And certainly in terms of people seeking um, you know, uh, inequality. Um, luckily, the federal government and the courts have been there to a degree, not as much as they could have been, but to a degree. So, yeah, I mean, if it we're going to, it's not a balanced scale, but I do think that, uh, you know, the answer, I'm going to go back to my original answer, which is yes, you see both, but yeah, maybe more despotic stuff on, on the part of states. So, let's get kind of a you know a sense of how adam's insights works throughout uh, i mean we've probably been talking about this works throughout uh, history uh in his new book the divided states of america and this is something i i tried to read this last week but i didn't get through uh, all of it the political scientist donald kettle uh surveys the state of federalism uh and concludes that the founders bargain back to practical politics is tearing the country apart instead of holding it together. And one of the key arguments that is made is from an economic point of view and says that what they set up was this competition between the states and it undermines the notion of forming a national identity. And, and one of the examples that is used, and we hear this often in California, 
all right? Instead of having a national kind of economic plan, you pit state against state, and in an economic sense, it forces wages down, it forces labor protections away, it, you know, it, it has a lot of negative impact by creating this, this federal union of competition. Uh, so I'm curious about your thoughts of, uh, about that, Professor Williams. Uh, do you, would you agree with uh, Professor Kettle that uh, their plan, which was a practical solution, ended up historically and more contemporarily, you know, historically, because the union failed in 1860-61 of tearing us apart rather than building a union of, of, of we the people? Okay, well, I haven't, I haven't read Kettle's work, so I'm kind of talking out of turn here, but there's been a, f a few things you've just kind of thrown around with his argument, like, was it bad economically? I would say maybe. Was it bad in terms of national identity? I think yes, I buy that argument. Um, so, but, but I, I think, it, I mean, I think about a state like Germany that has a, that has a, a federal system, right? But what Germany has is they have a federal system, but they have an interest group type of system that's called um, corporatism. So basically the Germans government says, okay, um, labor, who is your representative, right? All of labor, you guys get a set to come in, business, you come in, agriculture, you come in, and let's as a government come up with a five-year plan about how we can negotiate what's in the best interest of all these different sectors, and we're gonna implement that. Um, so they're a federal system that have used corporatism to come up with more of these sort of unified state economic plans. United States, as we know, has a pluralist system, right? Like you go back to Washington, DC, there's not one representative for labor. <laughs> there's like tens of thousands and there's not one representative for business. There's tens of thousands and they're all competing with each other. So I think those of, those of you who want a more unified economic system, I'm not sure if it's federal versus unitary or whether it's the, the, the interest group system that you adopt. But then my other point would be, and again, I haven't read Kettle, um, I don't know, in terms of economic growth models, right? If that's gonna be the size of the economy, um, it seems like the United States has done a pretty good job with its federal system in growing the economy. Now we can talk about whether he's measuring equity and, and other things, but um, yeah. So those are my, without reading his work, those would be my thoughts. Well, I mean, here's the one, I mean, again, what part of what he's talking about economically is and, and you know this in California, Mike, uh, you know, we're being slammed now in the national press for losing population, allegedly losing businesses. Texas actively, actively and through public relations is recruiting Ameri you know, Californian corporations. Well, yeah. what's the overall impact of that for the union, especially for the working man, is in order to compete, and we know this when it comes to tax uh, benefits, how does a locality get someone to come as you offer tax breaks, which end up becoming the burden of the larger taxpayer, the workers' wages, wages go down. So, I mean, that is, main, is his main argument economically as far as this federal system, but he also has a whole section on, on the political impact. Now. Professor Moore, Kavanaugh, well, the larger uh, picture here I, about- I Adams. hear I hear the Webster-Hain debates in all of this. Um, <laughs> Well, no, I not to be, just to be uh, be a s smart aleck, but I, I do because those Webster Hain fights were exactly what uh, we're talking about here. This the the Webster Hain fight, uh, fight in the Senate was essentially over who's going to get uh, the profits from sales in the Western lands. Would the federal government get it, or would the states keep those dollars? And so uh, I think. Again, as a, I don't have any answers about anything, current policies, but all I'm suggesting is this is not a new thing, this fight between federal control of, of budgets, incentives, um, because it, it happened in the Jacksonian era over, over Western land sales. Well, remember, history doesn't repeat itself, it rhymes. It rhymes, and, yes. Uh, you know, one of the tasks the students have to deal with uh, here is to assess Adam's perspective yeah. throughout American history. And I, I get, I, I think that's brilliant to refer to the well, West. Occasionally, thing. occasionally, occasionally. Uh, no, more than occasionally. Professor Kavanaugh? Yeah, you, I'm sorry, uh, Chris, I, I jumped in on you there. No, no, that was, that was okay. Um, you know, I think back to Mike's point about the Bundestag, 
you know, it is a, you also have to, I, I, it's a, you know, it's a parliamentary system. So it is going to be a little bit of a different system. And the German system is a fascinating one to really dive into. I don't think we have the time here. So, but it is interesting there. But I mean, I think that the, the push and pull has always been there. You know, and, and will always be there. And, you know, we, say, we use that term baked into the cake. Uh, you know, so I, I'm not familiar with this professor's work either. Kettle, as, as you says his name. Um, but, you know, we see that, you know, competition is set up, you know, by the nature uh, of, you know, we live in a basically a controlled capitalist society. And that's always going to be kind of set up in, in that system, right? Um, I just, David, you're, something you said triggered a memory for me because, excuse me, on the west side of Indianapolis, uh, where I used to live, um, we had a, we had the air, air industrial park come in and we did the exact same thing. You know, we offered incentives and tax breaks for people to bring in the, to this warehouse, you know, economy. But originally it was going to be pretty good until the state legislature did away with the inventory tax. So when the inventory tax went away, uh, you know, the, the idea that our, our local community who we lost homes because of the expansion, uh, we thought, well, okay, we can, we can, we can deal with this uh, because there will be profits, so will be jobs for some folks. And, uh, but the inventory tax then is done away with at the state level. And therein lies the issue, which is, becomes a political economic issue for, I'll say, special interest groups. Uh, and I'm, I'm going off on a different tangent here. I don't mean to, but um, I think that push and pull has always been there, though. It's always going to be there. I often, I often wonder, too, if, if the uh, Jackson and the bank issue is also into this. Because when they, when they uh, tear the bank apart, all that money then filters into uh, state level or local uh, state level yeah. banks. So that, there's that uh, financial tension between consolidated uh, banking and decentralized banking. Uh, again, another example, early, early American history on how this imperial imperium dynamic is in play. Yeah. For the students watching, I mean, I think it's a great, and this is, again, a different tangent, but based on what Tim said, for the students watching, if you're studying the Great Depression, go back to the, the battle over the bank with Jackson and the decentralization of the banking power. Because uh, I think there's a link to be found there between the Great Depression and that debate, um, you know, uh, almost a century prior. So let's uh, let's get into the document a little bit. I think we could all agree that Article One, Section Eight, Nine, Eight, Nine, and Ten provide the best clarity uh, on on this federal <laughs> system. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I should have put that one in quotes huh? uh, there. <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, on this notion of federalism and uh, divided uh, sovereignty. What else in the Constitution might you direct students to look at uh, as sources of this uh, federal system, uh, Professor Moore? Oh, I'm going to say maybe Article 1, Section 4. Uh, oh, wait, that's that's coming up. Um, you know, the, the Republican Clause, the Guarantee Clause, uh, I think is a good uh, illustration of the trade-off local local power but the federal government may occasionally have to step in and say you're not uh, representative enough um you know the 10th amendment also is a is of, often nearly always pops into the discussion about uh local control versus uh retained local control uh so th those two i would i would pose to students to think through a little bit uh, professor williams and again, you can refer to, to Article 1, 8, 9, and 10. I just, uh, uh, you know, if, if you think there's something specific in there uh, that jumps out at you as framing this uh, divided sovereignty federal system. Uh, but uh, if there's somewhere. Yeah, know, somewhere. Let me, I'll just add two more to what, what Tim just said. The first one, eh, maybe the amendment process, just in terms of uh, yeah. giving the states a role to play there, is going to be important. And then I would just point out to the students, you know, we're all kind of, we're all kind of smiling and giggling when we talk about Article One, Section Eight. So, students, you should go take a look at those at those powers. And as you're doing it, there's a, there's a lot of case law. I mean, this is where you get into what is on paper, and then how that's interpreted um, through court cases and by politicians over time. So, just 
the notion of what commerce is, right, <laughs> um, is something that has um, many, many, many different decisions on it that's super important. Um, and it, it helps you understand the idea of, of the Constitution as being this living document, right? By just writing commerce doesn't solve the question uh, for generations to come at all. So I would say to dig into those provisions and to really kind of look at them with a, a 21st century eye. Professor Kavanaugh? Well, these guys, um, I was definitely going to say Article 5 because the states absolutely have a role to play there. Um, and you see some of that still being debated about right now in terms of maybe the uh, balanced budget amendment uh, to get an Article 5 convention called uh, giving the states a great deal of power. And certainly, um, I would think of the full faith and credit clause in the beginning of Article 4 as well. And, you know, Tim mentioned the um, uh, the uh, Republican Guarantee Clause in Article 4. And I think it's important to also for the students to pay attention to, because at the, at the ends of a lot of these clauses, it says, oh, and Congress may have the power to decide, you know, through future uh, much like uh, much like the um, you know the enforcement clauses in certain amendments that we begin with the, the 13th amendment or much like the necessary and proper clause at the end of article 8 uh, excuse me article 1 section 8 um, so I, I do think the students need to pay attention to they they've uh, the framers have allowed congress to play a much larger role uh, which they at times they have and and in the last i don't know uh, maybe 100 years they haven't so I am curious, uh, is, I don't know, for some reason I was giggling inside about this, this whole commerce notion, all right, uh, we know it comes from the Marshall Court, they articulate this commerce clause and interpret it broadly uh, for its time, and then it, it got, I mean, was was that just happen chance, uh, or did later courts just kind of, you know, oh, good, thank you, Mr. Marshall, uh, and that is those who would fall into that nationalist category who would maybe agree with Adams and want a stronger national government, Marshall gave them uh, the, the, you know, the secret key, uh, the secret code to be able to achieve that. Uh, Mr. Moore? Well, Cohen, uh, Cohen's versus Virginia is another smackdown on the states. Uh, Dartmouth College, is uh, that case is another smackdown on the states. Uh, an obscure case that I always kind of got a giggle out of is a uh, board of, um, it was the Cooley decision, uh, 1840s, where uh, there was it was a commerce case, and uh, it involved whether local river pilots had control to navigate through. I think it was the Delaware River. Uh, so, is this a national policy issue or is it a local policy issue directly related to uh, uh, ships coming into port in Philadelphia? And it it granted uh, broad broad power to the federal government. So there, there's from uh, from McCullough uh, and Gibbons, I mean, there's a whole there's a whole raft of Marshall decisions that are uh, very expansive in how they're they're configuring commerce. Yeah. Well, I think that for insight for the students too, for for John Marshall, if you go back and and look at his uh, very short autobiography, you know he talks about being at um, Valley Forge with with the general Washington and seeing men from all of the colonies and so i think he early on gets his view of nationalism and, and we know that he's a leading federalist at the virginia ratifying convention um we, he's a leading federalist within the party as that's how he ends up as you know secretary of state and uh, chief justice at the same time uh, um which is a, a rarity so you have to go back to i think to take a look at his development as a person and how he sees his country and that gives you insights into rulings like Gibbons v. Ogden and McCullough v. Maryland uh, in terms of granting broader power to the national government. So maybe, David, you're right that he does give them the, the secret decoder ring, you know, uh, drink more Ovaltine uh, kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I just wanted to also bring up to the students, I mean, none of us have mentioned yet, I mean, the 14th Amendment, which obviously completely upends what Adams was reading in 1790 as, as federalism. But what's fascinating, so we, we'll talk about this on other segments, I know the 14th Amendment, but it's fast, if you think about the 1964 Civil Rights Act, right? I mean, Congress used the Commerce Clause as a way to justify their power to enact uh, some of those provisions. So it is, it, 
it, it is a word, it is a concept in the Constitution under uh, Section 8 that has had very sort of various uses over time that, that I think students, as you're preparing your remarks on this, that you would be wise to kind of look into those different ways that commerce has played out. I just, and, and maybe this is a quick response because I've always struggled with trying to explain to kids ha how to handle the supremacy clause. I mean, is the supremacy clause really that important or is it a no duh uh, kind of thing? Yeah, if, you know, if uh, federal and state law contradict each other and the federal power, I guess, is enumerated or articulated by the court, then federal law is supreme. Is that the essence of the supremacy clause or is there anything else they should know about it or, uh, you know, be able to use? But Mr. Moore is about ready to laugh at me for my- No, 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 no. I think, I think at a most basic level, the supremacy clause isn't that big of a deal if you're committed to enumerated powers. I think where folks really start to jump ship is combining the supremacy clause when, pe when people start talking about implied powers plus in supremacy clause is when people uh, get worked up. Uh, I mean, in a textual sense, in a textual sense, the supremacy clause only applies to the enumerated, uh, the enumerated powers. Those are supreme. But through however, our evolution, through however, our evolution, we have some implied powers that have been discovered or divined or, or whatever phrase you want to use, and you throw in supremacy clause, and that really, I think, rankles uh, localists' uh, sensibilities, right? Tie their intestines in knots. That's my new euphemism. There we go. Uh, there we okay. go. Uh, Professor Kavanaugh, uh, thoughts about that? Because uh, my my pushback on Professor Moore is, and, but he's absolutely right. I guess my pushback is to people that have problems with implied powers because Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18, clearly imply implied powers there. Well, it depends, how you, it depends how you read the, the uh, for carrying into execution the foregoing powers. Read it more. Read it more. I, I, <laughs> right. Word. So if the court articulates commerce in a certain way, that is a foregoing power. Well, uh, you know, I, I maybe, but maybe I'm just going to channel my inner Justice Thomas here and say, you know, <laughs> For all I, you know, we might as well be like, uh, you know, uh, trying to figure out football scores, right? And, and then I think that was in uh, Gonzalez v. Raich, right? In the uh, case out of the California originally on uh, compassionate use uh, of marijuana for medical marijuana, and the Supreme Court struck that down using the Commerce Clause, I might add. Uh, so, and then Justice Thomas uh, dissented, thinking that was a overreach by the government so i you know i i i'm gonna agree with tim he's right tim's always right <laughs> not true uh, okay I, i'm not gonna I, I gotta i gotta divert my way away from uh the, the comment i was gonna make there so i'd like to 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 finish with kind of a question i think to build a bridge to our next session and once again i know we started with you professor williams we'll, we'll end with you beginning this uh, one of the scholars that I read this week, I thought had an interesting insight about this federal arrangement. And he said that it contributed to a system of political parties. All right, so now we're bridging federalism and political parties that were way too broad, all right, in, in their essence, but also pressure groups or interest groups that were way too narrow, all right? to stand for a clear, wide-ranging national policy agenda. That, you know, what, Tim, what what Chris called the push and pull is that we have these very broad national parties, these very narrow interest groups, which make it virtually impossible for us to formulate national policy. And that is due to the federal structure uh, articulated in 1787. What do you think about uh, uh, that? Do you see a connective tissue between the formation of our parties and the federal system? Yeah, I, I do. And I, I would, I, I mean, I think, I think that's a good point. But the, the founders of the Constitution were trying to come up with a system that was going to be the most efficient on passing national laws. So I, 
I don't, you know, that, that wasn't sort of the goal of the system. The goal was to prevent tyranny and to prevent, I think, national tyranny was what they were, federal tyranny is what they were most concerned about, or at least they had to throw a bone to the anti-federalists and tell everyone that's what they were concerned about. So, yeah, I think that there is, I mean, you know, obviously the way I see things like institutions come out of the soil, come out of your society, they have to relate to your values. And those institutions then set up the rules by which we start to behave. And when we start to see problems within our institutions, we have to come up with ways to solve it. So if you are a, if you are a politician in Washington, DC, thinking about the national interest in the early 1800s, 1820s, and you see all these local interest groups kind of running, yeah, you're gonna be thinking, my goodness, we need something to bring us together or we're not gonna get anything done. And that's a whole different type of tyranny. So yeah, I think that those, the institutions that we came up with, which I think are part and parcel of our values coming from the 150 years of benign neglect, um, parties are a way to sort of try to solve one of those, one of those problems. Um, and I would, I would add that by maybe solving that problem, parties created a hundred other problems that we could talk about, but that's the way it goes. That's a great way to end with Martin Van Buren. Uh, the first national party guy. That's that's good, Mike. That's good. <laughs> uh, Professor Moore, thoughts? No, I have none. I I can't uh, I can't top Martin Van Buren there. No, I, I'm 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 done, man. Professor Kavanaugh. <laughs> well, I mean, when he invokes Martin Van Buren, the 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 greatest sycophant perhaps in American <laughs> political history, it's hard to it's hard to move on past that, honestly. Um. But what's wow, your original? You, got, David, you guys David, are surrendering. surrendering no, no. What's your? Society. What was your original question? So go back to what was your original question? <laughs> oh, this takes me back to the classroom. What was that, Mister Richmond? Uh, yeah. What did you ask? Uh, yeah. And again, you, know, so, you know, when you tell a teenager something, the first word out of their mouth is going to be what? <laughs> well, the, the the connective tissue between the structure of federalism and our political party system, and part of it you could look at it in a comparative sense, but our political parties generally, at least historically have been very broad, all right? Well, um, whereas the interest groups in which, you know, you can say Madison, yeah. so that you, you now, I triggered your memory. There. What do you yeah, think? Yeah, so the idea of these narrow interest groups uh, competing within these broad political parties um, in the federal system, is that been good or bad? Is that your question? Yeah. Um, and I'm gonna go with yes. Um, they, they've been both. I mean, again, I think it's, I know that's an oversimplification and a cop out, but I think so much depends on what you want to see accomplished. I think I, I see I see interest groups now um, that stand in the way of what the majority of people want, and because of their ability to finance political parties, those political parties become beholden to that uh, financial gain. It becomes in their interest to stand in the way of things. It becomes in their interest to create wedge issues to drive people apart. So I think uh, political parties have learned to capitalize on that. But I also have seen special interest groups that have been trying to push for an expansion of rights, for an expansion of folks. And they've had to make appeals to political parties as well. The trouble is with for so many of those special interest groups, their pockets aren't as deep as say, you know- The National Rifle Association. I was going to say big oil okay. um, because they have some really, really deep pockets are the NRA. Sure. Um, so I, I think the answer to that again is yes. And just so much, so much of it just depends on how you, which issue you're talking about. Well, you said it all depends on what we want to see accomplished. What I want to see accomplished is that we, we, the people promote the common welfare and secure the blessings of Liberty to ourselves and to our pos posterity. That seems to be the mission statement that we're involved in. And this is a good place to wrap up this session on American federalism and John Adams. Before we go, I, I would be remiss if I didn't pay tribute to the United States uh, Ryder Cup team for their uh, uh, you know, can of whoop, uh, whatever, on, uh, on the European team uh, this last weekend in the beautiful state of Wisconsin at a place that almost looks like England. Uh, and the weather is definitely like uh, England there. Uh, but Ireland. We also have, yeah, we also have to pay tribute to uh, uh, to the Green Bay Packers for uh, uh, letting California know its place. And of course, the Milwaukee Brewers 
And I would advise to all of you that we are seeing a fundamental shift in American uh, sports culture from New York and Los Angeles to the dominant sports state is Wisconsin. All right, the Brewers not, not if you Boston. watch not if you watch the Badgers this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, think about it. Go Wisconsin. All right. Uh, all right. Until next week, ladies and gentlemen. Peace, love, yogurt, tacos. Bye, 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 bye.